Welcome to our Enology webinar series. Our presenter today is Dr. Marco Palma. Dr. Palma is a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M University. He is the director of the Human Behavior Lab, a transdisciplinary facility that integrates state-of-the-art technology to measure biometric and neurophysiological responses of human decision-making. All right, so Dr. Palma, Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for this invitation. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Botasatu for the invitation to be here. Uh, it is really a pleasure. Thank you for all of you who have taken your time to attend this webinar. Uh, I was an extension economist for 10 years and I still continue to do extension work as part of my duties. I am a strong believer in the land grant mission and I think that uh, knowledge and research is only relevant when it is put out there for individuals who are actually making the decisions across uh, the state and even beyond uh, the state of Texas. So the reason I am here today is because I believe in this land grant system mission. And I think it's important that uh, our lab brings some of the insights in terms of human behavior and human decisions to make it uh, usable and understandable to the citizens of the state of Texas. Um, and also, as an agricultural economist, I feel an extra obligation to help Texans who are trying to make a living through agriculture, which is a very important uh, um, uh, en en enter enterprise in the state of Texas. So the purpose of my being here is to give you some simple strategies that you can use, uh, hopefully to make your business more profitable. And so I'm going to start by letting, telling you a little bit about my lab, the Human Behavior Laboratory at Texas A&M. Um, I'm doing this so you can understand a little bit of how it works and how, some, how we match some of the equipment with human decisions. And you can understand some of the capabilities of the type of work that we are able to do at the lab. Then I'll tell you a little bit about an experiment that we ran with a partner. Um, and how to increase the profitability of a wine tasting room. And here with me is Jeff Puller, program manager. He was instrumental in making this experiment happen. Um, after the uh, experiment ran in the lab, we also have an experiment that was conducted inside. And so he will actually take time, tag team here with me uh, a little bit to, to showcase a little bit of what we did in the experiment. And then I'll explain some uh, basic concepts of behavioral economics that you can use uh, in your tasting rooms and in, in your business in general to try to change uh, consumer uh, behavior. So what is behavioral economics? Uh, we in general talk about behavioral economics as a method of economic analysis that applies psychological insights into human behavior to explain economic decision making. So what this means is that we are no longer as economists just interested in predicting what people are going to do, but we're also interested in the underlying mechanisms that motivate people to take those actions. And it's in those mechanisms that motivate people to make the decisions that we can really understand, predict, and try to change human behavior. And so how do we do that? Well, um, the, the, the Human Behavior Laboratory at Texas A&M is the largest academic laboratory in the world. And as the name suggests, we study human behavior of different types using uh, the latest technology and the latest advanced um, uh, equipment paired with principles of economic and behavioral, economic, uh, behavioral economics. Uh, we have over $2 million worth of equipment and software at the lab and our equipment can track all of these categories shown in your computer screen uh, at this time in order to uncover how people make decisions and how they ultimately uh, can help to make better decisions for themselves. So some of the equipment that we have tracks uh, the visual attention using eye tracking devices and those are conducted either on computer screens or they can also be used in more a natural environment so that we can use glasses and take uh, those anywhere we want to see what captures the attention, the visual attention of, of people. Uh, we can also look at uh, some emotional arousal by looking at the pupil size. So with the eye trackers, we not only capture what people are looking at, but we have some sense of how they're reacting in terms of being aroused or being attracted to different things. 
But people may be looking at these uh, things because they like or they dislike perhaps some of the things they're looking at. And they might be reacting this emotional arousal. And so it's important for us to also put a little bit of understanding as to the motivations or the, the uh, emotions that people go through. And so how do we do that? We have equipment that tracks the movements in the muscles of the face, and we use this facial expression analysis to assess how people are reacting emotionally. And emotions are very important because uh, we human beings act under different charged emotions in very different ways, and these constant changing moods affect the way in which we interact with other human beings, how much we shop at the grocery store, and even uh, how we drive, and, and, and it, it changes our behavior in ways that perhaps even when we don't realize it, it makes a profound effect in how we uh, act and interact with other human beings. Uh, we're also able to do physiological responses uh, of these emotions, so we can look at stress uh, signals, for example, heart rates, respiration rates, uh, we can do a galvanic skin response, and, and we can also look at the activity in the brain directly. And so this helps us to really understand, uh, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that is uh, related to decision making, and, and we can really uh, assess what's driving that, that behavior. And so uh, uh, a couple of other things that we normally use is decision time in the sense that you're trying to choose between an apple and an orange, but you're taking a very long time. Perhaps that's a decision that the, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, an outcome that maybe you, you're facing a decision that is difficult to you. But if, if you're taking a relatively easy amount of time to choose between uh, one dollar or a thousand dollars it's because it's an easy decision perhaps and so decision times is also something that we use as a measure of how strong preference or preferences might be for different products so the research question I want to pose to you today is can the human behavior lab help Texas wineries increase the profitability of their tasting rooms by using principles of behavioral economics and as an experimental economist, I get this question all the time. Uh, the question is, you know, can these principles really be used for business decision beyond just doing some research that might be published in, in some journals? And so uh, we also decided that there are so many factors that make a winery successful that we could possibly focus on many of them. And so we concentrated on menus because we thought that's something that it's easy to change. It's, it's, it's something that may have a big impact in the bottom line sales. And it's where a lot of the work that goes through in some of these wineries is the final presentation that can make or break uh, the business in the sense that you've done through the hard work of choosing your varieties, the choosing the processes, you you have all of the scientific uh, work that is done and the art that goes along building that perfect wine that you're so proud of. Well, the menus represent that final way in which you present the products that you're proud of to the consumer. And so this is why we decided to concentrate our efforts in trying to optimize the tasting uh, room menu to increase profitability without raising the prices on the menu. So one thing to keep in nature here, I'm going to talk a, li a little bit about this later on, but that is that we can change prices and have a different effect. But in this case, we're keeping the prices constant and just changing some behavioral economic principles to see how they affect profitability in a real uh, winery. And so, Here's what we did. We partnered with Messina Hoff, who was very kind to let us work with them and their staff to redesign their wine menus. Uh, they share their weekly data and they even allow us to, to take our equipment into their tasting room and run our experiment with their actual customer. Uh, Messina Hoff was the perfect choice for us because they're only about 50 minutes away from our lab, which meant that uh, we can send some of our staff uh, and, and Jeff Poole, who's here with me today, took a, a few of our grad students or PhD students and they didn't really have to drive all the way to the hill country and back, considering that we did this pilot study without any sort of funding. Um, what we did is that we took, we um, uh, 
uh, we take the existing Messina Hub menu and redesign it using about 10 different principles of behavioral economics. Now, because of time constraints, I'm only going to be able to talk about three or four of those changes that we made uh, during this webinar. Once we did these changes uh, to the Messina Hof staff, um, Anas decided to run and redesign our menu for one week, and we tested that new menu for that entire week. Then we reverted it back to the normal menu for another week, and then we changed this for a period of one month. Um, now, you might be asking why we did this, and essentially it's because in the environment in which we were trying to make this test, the menus coexist, and in many cases the same menus are passed around from one table to the next, and so it was not feasible for us to have uh, uh, randomized one menu to half of the, po the population or the clients and then randomize the new menu to the other half because there would be some potential contamination effects from that. And so this is the reason we actually uh, decided to go this other route and do one week with the new menu, one week with the other menu. And we have an extended period of one month to look at sales and compare the sales between those. And then the Messina Hof staff would send us their weekly tasting room sales report. And uh, a big thanks to Savannah Gaines for doing most of the legwork on Messina Hof's behalf. Uh, and getting that data to us so we can analyze the impact of these cha behavioral economic changes. So after a month of running the experiment, we saw that the, the redesigned menu outperformed the old menu in terms of sales by around 15%. And so 15% sounds great to most people. It's like fantastic news. But as a researcher, I was a really, a really bit concern, I was not comfortable exactly because I could not determine exactly why the sales were increasing. I could not pinpoint to exactly what was the factor that increased those sales. I'm going to show you the importance of that when we talk about uh, the rationale behind these behavioral economic principles. And so what did we do? Well, uh, Jeff took uh, uh, about a $200,000 worth of equipment and a few of our staff members to go to Messina Hof and, and actually look at what was driving that increase in sales. And so what they did is that they lurked by the entrance of the tasting room and before clients walked into the winery, they asked them to choose their wine selection based on the digitized menu that we had in our equipment. And so one customer would go to the equipment that displayed the original menu and it was random. And then another customer will randomly be assigned to the condition in which we had the actual, uh, the new redesign uh, menu. And so that way we can look at the differences between how people actually behave in the process of making the decision. And so um, after that, we started to quantify what was the difference. And so here are the main results. In, uh, of what you really want to know. And I want to qualify this by saying that these results mirror the weekly sales numbers that we just talked about from a Uh You'll see that I underlined the word here new and in terms of the wine selection increased by about 18.4% when using our redesign menu with new customers. And so you've noted that I highlight the word new here, and that is something that is very key in terms of looking at quantifying our weekly sales data. Because we discovered that Messina Hav has a very strong, loyal, loyal following of regular uh, uh, clients. And these regulars, they typically don't even look at the menu because they already know what they want. They have been at going to Messina Hub for a while and uh, they don't look neither at the original nor at the new menu because they already know what they're going to order even without looking at the menu. And so this was the reason why we couldn't really pinpoint what was going on in terms of uh, driving those sales. Um, so in case you have to leave the webinar early, take this piece of information with you in the sense that your menu should be targeted to those customers who are relatively new or that have never visited your winery before. Because those who are very knowledgeable that are not necessarily even paying attention might uh, not necessarily be impacted as much because if they're not looking at the menu, they're not going to use it to order different wines. 
And so the menu here is the key decision and the final tool that goes along a long process that you started when you started the production of your wine. So in terms of the uh, uh, field experiment results, the average price per client per glass increased from about $7.6 to an average of about $9. So a little bit over $2 per glass in terms of the wine selection using the redesigned menu that incorporated these behavioral economics uh, principles. So I was actually a little bit surprised to see that when we quantified that uh, total increase, it was only in the magnitude of about 18%. Honestly, uh, I think that Jeff and I were expecting something a little bit closer from about 20 to 30% increase. But uh, we really attribute these lower than expected increase in sales, which is still pretty good. I mean, a 20, uh, almost a 20% increase is, is actually something fantastic. But uh, perhaps this uh, lower than expected increase in sales was due to Messina Hoff's exceptional description that they already hide it, had in their menus. So after looking at the results of our, our tracking, um, you can see how the customers actually went through and read the descriptions of the wine that they were selecting. And just so that you know, uh, there is this availability that uh, Jeff and some of the other staff and myself included can use the equipment uh, and it's available to assist you in your business as well in case you're interested. So you may reach out to, uh, uh, to Jeff or to me or to somebody from the Human Behavior Lab. You have the website uh, address in the corner of, of the slides. However, the purpose of my talk today is to give you some strategies that you can start using today on your own without necessarily using uh, our help. And hopefully, uh, we'll accomplish that by the end of the webinar. So when we talk about wine, we're not necessarily talking about uh, necessities of products that people can really uh, uh, buy just for the sake of because they need it. When we talk about wine, there's a lot of branding and prestige, and there's a lot of luxury that goes along wine. And in this experiment, uh, Plasman and her colleagues conducted uh, this experiment in which they showed uh, individuals in an Ivy League university in the Northeast. Uh, there were faculty members who were very knowledgeable about their wines, or so they thought. And uh, this is the experiment. They gave these individuals two different bottles of wine. One was priced at $90, and the other one was priced at $10. Now, here's the catch. The two bottles of wine were identical except for the price. Now, I'm picturing here two different colors for the $90 bottle of wine and the, and the $10 bottle of wine so that you can see the difference in what happened. But in reality, the labels were completely identical and it was the exact same bottle of wine from the same harvest year and everything except for the price tag. Now, when people were asked which of the two wines they prefer the taste of, everything came up to be better with the $90 bottle of wine. Now, that might not be surprising to you, but what Plasma and her colleagues did is, did is that then they asked individuals to taste the wine, and while they were tasting the wine, they looked at their brains to see what was going on in their brains while they were tasting the wine. Now, that graph that you can see uh, in the right of your screen shows the activation in the medial orbitofrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that it's right behind our eyes in the middle of the brain. And it's the part of the brain that processes the pleasantness or the pleasure of smells and taste. And as you can see, the, uh, this part of the brain activated a lot more with the $90 bottle of wine compared to the $10 bottle of wine. Now this is fascinating because remember it's the exact same bottle of wine but our brains are giving us more pleasure when we consume something that we believe is more prestigious. So this is the power of branding and in many cases uh, our brains are, are giving us that reward system that help us to process that information whether it's perceived uh, or it's real, our brains are convinced and are giving us that pleasure information. Now, in economics, we have a long tradition of evaluating this type of consumption. 
and we typically uh, uh, denominate these conspicuous consumption. And this term was coined by uh, Thorstein Bevelin. And in his uh, studies, he essentially said that conspicuous consumption is something that states something of the following. In order to gain and hold the esteem of men, it is not sufficient to merely possess the wealth or power because the wealth and power has to be put on evidence only with the evidence of the wealth or power is the esteem awarded uh, and not not just in in terms of having it so what this means is if you have a uh, uh, a ferrari in your farm but you never take it out having that ferrari there does not give you the same level of satisfaction that if you drive the beautiful car in one of the top avenues in downtown Houston or downtown Dallas or downtown uh, Austin or any of these other uh, places. So why is this important? Because winery tour tours are a reflection that indicates affluence. They're a way of showcasing this type of conspicuous consumption in a way. And so if people want to signal their wealth to their friends, to their colleagues, and to their neighbors, then they can discuss how excellent this Tempranillo wine was at the uh, winery that, uh, that they went to. They're not necessarily talking to their friends about how much money they saved by choosing that Tempranillo over something else. They are um, showcasing how good this Tempranillo wine was and that's part of that uh, conspicuous consumption. So when we think about wine, do not think about this being some sort of necessity product that people are uh, penny uh, pinching for in terms of wine. If that is the case, maybe that's there's not uh, uh, really correlation in terms of the wine consumption that it came to get. And so I'm going to mention, as I said before, a few principles of, of behavioral economics. And the first one is choice architecture. And this term was coined by Thaler and Sunstein uh, and refers to the practice of influencing the choice that people make by changing the manner in which the options are presented to people. So we know in general how people process different type of information. How do we know that? because we have these eye tracking devices, so we know how people actually look at the menu, we know the order in which most people tend to look at it. And so here in the Western Hemisphere, because of the way we read, we know that people look at information and process it from left to right, bottom, uh, top to bottom, and they start processing that information in that way. And so I'm going to be showing you some examples here in a minute of how people actually process the wine information. But the design, you need to design your menu to be easier and understandable to your customers. Not necessarily to you, but to your customers. And so one common way the wine menus are designed is categorizing the wines into, for example, dry, red, dry reds, semi-sweets, white wines, uh, roses, or perhaps dessert, dessert wines. And this design strategy makes sense because depending on what the person is looking for, they can go to this category and we want to make it easier for people to find what they're looking for. And so when we are adding value to your customers, remember that value is the relationship between the benefits that the consumers get divided by the price or the cost. Now here, when we typically think about price, we think about the monetary price, but it's not necessarily the only cost that consumers have to go through. These other things in terms of how difficult it is for them to find what they're looking for is an important consideration in terms of the cost. So we might wanna make sure that we reduce these other contextual decisions and make it as easy as possible for your customers to make their selections and to find what they're looking for. So in terms of choice architecture, for example, uh, here's an example in this slide. And as you can see here, you will notice that this snapshot of Messina House menu is that the wines are separated into different categories that consumers and customers can easily understand. However, I'm going to direct your attention to the blue arrow at the bottom of the screen 
And this section on their menu is where Messina Hof plays their truly exceptional wines. Those wines are, that are really a synonymous with Messina Hof itself. And they also, because they're the best wines, they command premium prices. So they tend to be the most expensive or at least at the top of the price uh, scale in terms of the menu. So when we started looking at our design, we found that only 6% of new customers chose, chose the Paulo wine when using the old menu. Uh, we attribute this lack of sales perhaps to the fact that unless you're a regular uh, customer, then they might not be familiar with the term Paulo wines. And for some of you who are familiar with the winery, you will know that this is because of the owner's name, and that name is reserved as synonymous of quality. And so there has there is a meaning in terms of those wines and the quality that goes along with them. But you have to be knowledgeable about the winery, and you have to uh, know a little bit about the history of the winery for you to understand this concept. So um, an average person that looks at this menu for the first time, and perhaps he's looking for a Cabernet Sauvignon, will stop his search once they saw the section for the dry red wines at the top on your right side of the computer screen and stop there without even realizing that there might be some other wines that belong to that category, but they're not part of that category. And so we, we think that maybe that's the reason why there were only 6% of new customers that were choosing wines within that calorie and so price might have you might be pondering was one interesting feature and again some of the stuff we're doing here is changing the layout of the menu without necessarily changing the prices so when we were designed the menu we eliminated the polo wines section and move the wines that were originally in that section to uh the category to where they belong to and so um we, we want, again, to make this redesign uh, very simple for your customers, and we want to add value by reducing the cost of people searching through what they are looking for. So in this next slide, you'll see that in our redesign, we place the Polo Wines category. Now, we placed it at the top, uh, and so uh, by doing so, we saw that the customers chose Palo wines from the 6% that we talked about in the previous slide, it went up to 22%. Just by looking at changing that to a position that, it, that actually show, it showed individuals that these wines commanded more attention. And because we know how people process this information and, and read through the menu searching for information, just changing the location of that, increase that uh, uh, almost uh, uh, more, more than three times, almost four times from 6% to 22%. Now, the next principle I want to talk about is anchoring. And the anchoring principle claims that an initial exposure to a number serves as a reference point and influences subsequent judgments about value. Um, and this process usually occurs without even our awareness. So there's a very famous movie in which a person is actually guessing a number and sees the same number over and over throughout the day. And by the time he's supposed to uh, guess the number, he guessed that exact number. Well, maybe that's taking it too far. But if we look at people choosing a random number, say between zero and 100, and they see a number in the upper 90s, we have seen that people actually end up guessing higher numbers than if you were to say, for example, see a number 10. So those anchoring conditions are very important because they set our minds, even without us being aware, whether we're looking at a high versus a low number. And so let me go back to the previous slide. And no, it's not by accident that I'm duplicating this slide because now I'm going to show case a little bit of this anchor principle. And I want to point out uh, how we incorporated the anchoring theory in this menu. The old menu started uh, with the top wine having a price stack of about $6 uh, per glass on a red blend, the least expensive wine on the menu. 
Now, this signal to people when they start looking at the menu and the first price they see is a six, they are anchored at that low price and they're looking for wines that might be similar. Anything that they look after that for $14, it's outrageously expensive because their mind was already uh, thinking about a low uh, $6 glass of wine. So we replace that uh, $6 glass red blend with um, a premium polo wine that has the highest menu price of $16. So now people are anchoring and looking at the first wine and they say, oh, this is a $16 uh, uh, glass of wine and they're anchoring that high price. So in relative terms, when they look at the rest of the menu, then the, the other wines that are somewhat in the middle might not necessarily seem as expensive. So the first thing is that we'll notice that wine first because of the location. They were anchored on that price and then they would either choose that from 6 to 22%, but then it will also serve the purpose of making sure that people are processing the rest of the wine in relationship to that high anchoring price. So the anchoring principle says that when people see the more expensive price first, it makes anything as uh, anything uh, else seems like a bargain. And so um, that's that's the second principle. Now the next thing I want to talk about is to 99 or not 99. That is the real question. I have a a good friend in the uh, marketing department. Uh, Alan Chen, who recently actually left to the University of Kentucky. Alan is a super smart uh, individual and he's done a lot of work, as have many others, in this area of the impact of having the 99 cent or any other different type of information. And it turns out that depending on how we process this, this information, whether we process it from left to right or right to left, we might change the perception of what the number is. It also turns out that depending on the number that is in the digits, it might make a difference. So if it's a number that we are very used to, for example, the numbers that are typically associated with everyday use, uh, suppose like a 6, uh, 12, because we buy things in dozens, a 10, that might actually anchor people to think about the number. So at 1099, uh, people might be more likely to process as a $10 versus 1199, because 11 is not something that we use all the time. People might actually process that as a 12. And so there are some caveats here in terms of how people process this information. But the point of all of these uh, is that when, um, when we incorporate this is to try to change the perception of how people see the prices in terms of saving a penny or two or even saving a dollar in a, in a glass of wine. Now, remember when we talked about wine being a luxury product? So if you're trying to sell a luxury product, we're not appealing for people to save a penny. We're not appealing for people to have one or less dollar. It's probably not going to make a big difference if people are choosing the wine that they really are after. And so it's important here for us that... Uh, uh, to separate wine from other different types of products that perhaps people need to see the value in terms of saving money. Uh, but in our case, we feel it's more important for individuals to choose the one that they really want to uh, buy. And so, uh, particularly, you know, we went through, for example, instead of saying a $6.99 a wine or a $6.75, we're going to go for the $7.00. And so uh, this is important because it might be an acceptable strategy for other uh, commodities. And this is important. I mean, if you go to a gas station and there's a price difference of even a, a one cent or 13 cents or of 20 cents that you can save per gallon, that makes a difference. And people are actually looking at something that is a commodity that gasoline should be pretty similar uh, regardless of the gas station, although some people may argue that the quality of the gasoline might be slightly different. But in general, they might be different. Uh, they might be very similar. And so changing the price makes sense. But when we're using an experienced luxury product like wine, we're not looking for the cheapest wine. Remember, I think I already said this about prestige, but when people are talking about coming to your winery and, sh and choosing a wine, they're not going to say, guess what? I saved 19 cents by choosing 
the six uh, $81 bottle of wine. No, they're going to talk about the quality of the one that they chose. And if it was more expensive, they might even point out, by the way, that was like $15 a glass, but it was totally worth it. Oh my God, what a good wine. And so that's what we're trying to sell here is the idea that when people go to your wineries, they're not looking for saving this money and penny pinching. They're looking for the experience of having a great time and also having a great product in a great atmosphere, in a good environment. And so um, uh, the other additional piece here, just as a tip, is that uh, some previous research, research has shown that only 1% of customers will leave a restaurant or a bar without making a purchase once they are seated. And most of the time, I will argue, this is not due to the price. It might be related to the service staff or whether somebody didn't come to uh, greet them right away and see them. So there are many factors as to why this might happen, but this is not something that happens very commonly. So uh, while we're on the topic of numbers, most people, as I pointed out before, in the Western Hemisphere, read from left to right, top to bottom. And so the first thing that uh, on a menu... Uh, that people will see are the dry white wines and rosés. Then they will read the dry red wine category, continue with the left to the right pattern, and then uh, the eye tracking will show what people uh, will do. And I'm going to show you that here in a in a few in a couple of minutes. But um, the process of doing this is very rapid. So these eye tracking devices have the capability of collecting 600 data points per second. I mean, that's very accurate information that goes along a uh, way to really show how people make these decisions. We don't even realize how much our eyes move when we process all of this information, but this equipment is very refined to the point that they are able to collect this data into the milliseconds up to a rate of 600 data points per second. And so we know this because all of the equipment that we have in the laboratory that tracks all of this information in a beautiful uh, way uh, and and in a in a way that it's that it's efficient for us to use that information. Um, so we have uh, some demonstrations of these process in the next few slides. So you can actually see how people were uh, processing. So in case you were distracted or doing something else, I direct your attention now to the meat of the presentation where we show how these eye tracking devices actually translate into the behavioral process of number one, processing the information, and number two, how do they actually translate to the uh, actual choice. So one of the things that you will observe here is that all the prices in this circle are in a row and they go top to bottom. And so I want to point your attention to that because in this next slide, what you are going to see is that, uh, so first of all, what you will see here is that dot means that the person who was looking at this, the, 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 the visual gaze is stopping in that particular area. And then the line show the transition between one point and the next fixation. And so you will observe here when I press play that people go into the category. They look at dry, white, red roses. Um, then they, they find a different category, semi-sweets, dry reds. Once they look at that information, they look at the price. Look, they look at the price and see what they were comfortable paying. Once they selected that price, they chose the wine. So it's almost like a backward induction. So let me replay that. So they start looking at the category. So they look at the first category here. They look at the second category. They look at the third category. Very fast, they go to the prices. They chose the price they looked, they went for, and then they went left to choose the wine uh, they were comfortable with. And so we have set up a menu in which the incentives for people to look at the information is to process it in categories. But once they select into the categories, they go and look at the price and they select the wine based on the price. So just like that example from Plasmin, they're looking at something that perhaps is not that expensive, 
perhaps not that cheap, but that's something that they might feel that is within a comfortable range that will actually be uh, the, uh, of their liking. Now, when we design our menu, redesign our menu, then you can see how uh, participants process the information. So let me press play again. And what you see is a very similar phenomenon here in terms of people still processing the information in categories. So you will see they go for the categories. But then, rather than looking at the price, because we change it from a column, they start reading the descriptions of the wine, looking at the wine that they want, and then after they look at something that might be appealing and interesting to them, they start looking at the prices. And you can see that information. They keep going down the list. And rather than choosing from price, going into a wine, they're choosing a wine and then looking at the price of that wine. And so you're really putting the incentives for people to choose something that they're really interested in, that they may be very happy with, that will uh, maximize the repurchase decision. Because if they chose something that they really like, chances are they're going to taste another wine, they're going to be happy, and they're going to come back and keep uh, tasting some other wines. And that's exactly what you want. So one of the things I, I'm, we're highlighting here is the fact that we're not really changing anything in terms of the price. Anything we're changing is the layout, and without even changing the prices, we can make a big difference in how people process that information. And at the end of the day, yes, we are all for you uh, guys increasing your profits, but we also are all for uh, the uh, population of Texas for tasting wines that are uh, within the state and enjoying this beautiful agricultural uh, agritourism uh, venue that is available to them. So there's a win-win situation in which if people choose something that is easier for them to choose, that they're happy about, excited about, that they had a great time with, and that at the same time they're supporting uh, their local agricultural uh, enterprises, that will make them more happy. And so the customers are happy, the wineries are happy, and we're uh, all uh, changing a little bit of, of the way in which the system is, is provided. So we can also do differences in terms of how uh, uh, males and females might choose differently. And so this slide is a heat map that showcases uh, how the decision is made by females and it shows the areas of interest, so there might be certain wines that uh, that might be more appealing to women. One thing to point out here is that this menu looks a little bit weird just because we cut the menu, which otherwise would be one long string, uh, into two different parts so we can showcase the output of the heat maps into one single slide. But the, the original menu is actually a a vertical menu where this last part with the dessert wines and sparkling wines goes below uh, the, the menu that you see on your left. And then we can see how individuals choose this uh, for males. So one of the key messages I want to leave with you is when we think about experimentation, it does not have to be in a multi-million dollar lab facility. In fact, I encourage you to make business experiments all the time because this is the only way in which you can understand behavior and you can see what happens when you change one thing. And I'm going to try to provide you one or two principles of how to do these experiments. But before I do that, I want to ask you to make this change. And change is something difficult. We as human beings like to navigate through life uh, uh, with the status quo flag because it's comfortable. We like what we are comfortable with. And in many cases, you go to different companies, you ask different individuals uh, why they do something one way. And I mean, in, there's, there's, there's evidence that people will just tell you because that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been done. So let me tell you about this experiment that some evolutionary biologists did. They placed six apes inside a cage, and then they placed a reward on top of the cage that consisted of fruit. It was grapes and bananas. And uh, as soon as one of the apes wanted to go to the top to get the fruit, the experimenters will use a hose to pour 
ice cold chilling water to all the other apes. So the natural reaction of the apes was to try to beat any of the apes that tried to go and get the reward. And they did this for a few weeks. Now, after a few weeks, they removed both the reward and also they, re they removed the punishment. And guess what? When one of the apes wanted to go to where the reward, the fruit, used to be, all the other apes would still beat that ape. So that's the danger of, danger of going through life, doing things the way they've always been done. Now, interestingly, they started removing one ape at a time and introducing a new ape until eventually none of the apes that were inside the cage were in the original situation where there was a reward or a punishment. So they no longer knew anything about a punishment or reward ever existing. But yet, when one of the apes wanted to go to the top, the other apes would beat them. Why? Because that's the way things have always been done. So that's the dangers of the no change mentality. Now, I want to uh, 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 tell you about one of the lessons that I've learned as an extension economist from business owners and entrepreneurs is that in order to survive and grow, you have to be a little bit like an experimenter with your business because you're constantly changing certain things to see how that actually uh, behaves in terms of increasing profitability or reducing cost. And nobody knows your business better than you. And so um, I want to show you this quote here. It's not necessary to change because survival is not mandatory. Now remember, uh, you need to be a little bit like, like Edison in the sense that we have to keep experimenting until we discover what consumers want. And even then, Consumer preferences change over time. And so just because we have found something that works doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot be improved. And so Edison once said that uh, about failing, in quotes, uh, 10,000 times, uh, 10,000 different materials to create the light bulb. And he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Now, take that to the heart, and, and, and I'm going to give you one principle of experiments. And this is that we need to think about incorporating things in our business one at a time. Why? Think about it this way. If you feel that you have a cold or if you have some sort of condition, the way in which we discover whether a drug a medicine works is that you give individuals randomly, half of the individuals, you give them the actual medicine and the other half receive a placebo so you can quantify the difference between the medicine and the placebo. Now think about what happens if rather than giving that individual one medicine, you give them six or seven or ten different pills. Well, the individual might get better but you don't know which of the 10 pills work. Now, this is the approach that many of us take in our businesses in the sense that we change 10 things at the same time and it works. We see our profits go up, but we don't know which of these 10 things is responsible for the increase in profits. And why is this important? Because when we have these 10 principles and we're doing all of those things that are costly, we might be leaving a lot of money on the table. But if we knew exactly what of the, th the 10 things worked, then we can really use that information to be more efficient in terms of the cost of, of, of what we do. And then we can be more efficient in increasing our profitability. And so I want to thank you very much for your attention and your time. And I'm going to leave my information and Jeff's information uh, here uh, on the computer screen in case you have any questions. Or if you uh, are interested in having us help you improve your sales, then you can contact Jeff and we can start to see if we can help you. Uh, uh, Andrea, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you for being with us today. Um, let's open the questions here. Hello. If you have any questions, please type them in the um, chat box. Okay. 
No questions? Okay. Uh, let me see. So I think there's a question here about... Oh, no questions for me. Just thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay. Okay. So one question that we normally get oh. is... Uh, is there a difference in price selection between males and females? Uh, this is Jeff Poole. I was the one that actually went to Messina Hoff uh, for a lot of this. Uh, the answer was no. Um, males and females spent just about almost on the same. It was just their, the difference in wine that they were uh, finding. Uh, we found some cases of... Uh, people not even looking at the price of wine. Uh, I asked one uh, female participant why she why she didn't even bother uh, looking, and she said, "Oh, I'm not paying. Uh, my boyfriend is, so I don't really care." Um, you got a big eye raise from the boyfriend, and I gave him the sign of "run away now." Um, but really, there was no big difference uh, between the two. Thank you. Um, fascinating. Um, Carol says, "How can we see the remaining principles?" Well, there's a bunch of them. Um, well, one way is for you to come and visit us at the lab, and we would be more than happy to give you a tour. Uh, you can get in touch with Jeff, um, and then we can do a demonstration. Um, we are always putting out information in terms of the other principles, and we, we're we coming up with new principles all the time. And so based on the – this is what the, the biggest mission of the lab – is, is, is a lot of research oriented in the sense that we're literally trying to discover all of these other principles. Um, and, 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 and because of the land grant mission of Texas a &E, we want to put those principles out. But there are many other things that are related to uh, behavioral economics. Um, they're wonderful resources if you're interested in terms of looking at how people process information by the different senses. I'm going to direct you here. To um, the Brain New Business is a good resource that I recommend. Uh, Melina Palmer has been doing some work with us in terms of uh, using all of these uh, principles to increase profit. So if you're interested in learning about these other things, I think she has a series of, of podcasts, about maybe close to 30 uh, podcasts, a little bit over 30 podcasts. One of them talking about one different principle, or at least something related to these behavioral principles. But the best way for you to, to talk about these and what might work and make sense for you is to uh, pay us a visit. So I encourage you to get in touch with Jeff and, 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 and have a conversation with us. All right, we got another question that says, uh, it appears the benefit slash cost argument isn't quite supported when the prices are a bit harder to find. Um, well, one of the things that I can give a quick answer and then see if this answers you, um, that we noticed that if you remember, go back a few slides where it had all the prices all in a row, we were noticing people were choosing their wine by the their wallet, not necessarily their palate. So we didn't like hide the prices. We just made it to where people wanted to read what they actually wanted because we figured the experience is what they were going after. So if they get exactly what they wanted instead of trying to save a dollar, we thought that would improve the experience. And that's kind of pretty much what a wine, you know, when people go to a winery, what they're looking for is the experience. So if it was a little bit harder, you know, we didn't get that complaint from any of the any of the customers. Dr. Palmer? So we don't so, allow them to focus on the wine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, it does. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. It does allow them to focus more on the wine and less on their, their wallet. And, and we believe that's a way of increasing the value of consumers because then, like, you see the process of them choosing something and being very happy about. Uh, when they choose one, maybe a dollar will not make a big of a difference. And so uh, the benefits in that case might outweigh the cost. Here is some extra information that we could show you in terms of how much they rated the wines, how happy they were about drinking those wines, how did they rate the experience. And we can use all of these other measures 
that we didn't really have time to go through to see whether people actually had a much better time and to actually look at that uh, benefit cost relationship in terms of the value provided to them. So we had a uh, actually had Melina Palmer uh, from the uh, podcast, The Brainy Business. Uh, so if you want to check out uh, The Brainy Business, we absolutely recommend it. Uh, she's fantastic. Um, what she does is a lot of the uh, how do I uh, incorporate the principles of behavioral economics into my business. That's what she focuses on. So either you can get in touch with me, uh, Jeff, uh, my email is still up on the screen, or you can uh, search The Brainy Business yourself. There was a question whether this presentation will be shared. Um, the presentation was recorded. The recording will be posted on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel. Um, Dr. Palmar, are you willing to um, share the slides? Yes, we can email you the slides. Um, if you're interested, let us know, and we're happy to, to email the presentation to you as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Palma, for being with us today. Thank you, Jeff, for being here, for sharing your knowledge. Thank you all for attending. Um, I ask you that you take two minutes to fill out the survey that will pop up um, at the end of this program. Um, I thank you all for being here and looking forward to our next presentation, next webinar. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.